Amen. Good to see you this morning. First Thessalonians this morning as we continue our series in the book of First Thessalonians. This book was written by Paul to this church in Thessalonica to encourage them, to thank them for the way they have responded to God and to God's message. Because of what has happened in this church since it was started, Paul calls them a model church, an example to other churches, and a very influential church. You see that, first of all, in verse 7, where Paul says, as a result of what's going on in the church, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And then verse 8, for from you the message of the word of the Lord has echoed forth, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place, reports of your faith in God have spread so that we don't need to say anything. And I really believe that the reason why the Lord led me to this book for us as a church to examine in this new year was because he wants to prepare us for what he has for us as a church. And there's really no better model, no better example of a local church in the New Testament than the church at Thessalonica. It was a model church to other churches. It was an example set forth. It, it was a very influential church. And if you and I are going to be that or become that, then there's certainly things that, that you and I can learn from what was happening at the church at Thessalonica. And so a couple weeks ago, we started looking at this, and we've now come to verses 8, 9, and 10. We're finally going to finish chapter 1 this morning. And uh, we're going to continue to look at the characteristics or the spiritual character of a church that becomes a model church and a church of influence. And again, hopefully all of us as believers desire to be part of a church where it's not just going through the routine and, and duty, if you will, of being a Christian, but we truly want to be part of, of what God's doing on this earth and be part of something supernatural, not just surfacy or superficial. So I'm going to give you the five characteristics up front this morning, and then I'd like to go back and examine them in detail this morning. Notice beginning in verse 8, the first characteristic, or as we continue with these characteristics, is they were a church that echoed forth the word of God. Second, they were a church that demonstrated faith in God, verse 8. Then in verse 9, they were a church that was turning to God, they were a church that was serving the living and true God. And finally, in verse 10, they were a church that was waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. Those are the five characteristics that we want to talk about this morning. And so let's begin with this fact of echoing forth the word. Notice he says in verse 8, For from you the message of the Lord, the word of the Lord, has echoed forth. This is the only time that this Greek word is used in the New Testament. It means to resound, to reverberate. It's talking about how the Word of God has been disseminated, if you will, through this local church, through their ministry, through the people of this local church. And this word also refers to the clarity of the sound and the loudness of the sound of something. In other words, he's saying the word of the Lord has gone forth from this local church very clearly and very loudly so that other people in other regions and in other places are in a sense hearing the word of God, coming in contact to the word of God through you and your ministry. Folks, that should be the goal of every local church. That we are a church 
that tries to get the Word of God out. That we want to echo it. We want to reverberate it. We want it to disseminate from us. Local churches can be very good at getting the message of themselves out, of who they are, of advertising so that people will come to their church. But we need to do a better job at focusing on not getting our name out there, but getting the word of the Lord out there and getting it spread. Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. It's the life-transforming message. It's the gospel. It's God's good news. It's one of the reasons why I believe the Lord led me to finally put in print a couple of things. Those books are not to get my name out there. They're not to get the oasis out there. They're to place in people's hands to get the word of God out there. It's why Jeff and his team, every week, we audio tape this service and we tape Wednesday nights. Why do we do that? Because believe it or not, not only those of you that want to listen to it again, which God bless you for listening to it twice, but, or maybe you missed and you want to listen to it, but folks, these messages go all around the world. We get, we get reports from people across the country, across the world, that listen to the podcasts of Wednesday and Sunday. Why does Jeff Underwood come weekly and put this service on video? Because it's another way for us as a church to do exactly what the church at Thessalonica was doing, and that is echoing forth the word of God. You and I have to continually uh, strategize and figure out how can we as a church get the word of God out more and more? How can I do that individually in my life? And how can I be part of a church where the word of God is getting out there? How can we as ministry leaders, how can we as, as people in this church, how can we get the word of God out to more and more people? That's from God's perspective how you and I become a church of influence. It's how we become a model church when the message of God is echoing forth and resounding and reverberating out from us. We're not to keep the message of God to ourselves. We are simply to be a conduit, a channel, that when God shares with us his word, when we're learning his word, when we're growing, when we're gaining insights from God's word through the Holy Spirit and spending time in God's word, God doesn't ever want us to keep it to ourselves. Everything that God shares with us, he wants to then share with others. And you and I need to be conscious of that individually, and we need to be conscious of that as a church. That's one of the things that made the church at Thessalonica an influential church. It echoed forth the message of the Lord. Number two, another thing that made this an influential church was it was known for demonstrating its faith in God. And notice here again in verse 8 that, that it, it is emphasizing the object of our faith. Not the size of our faith, not the, the maturity of our faith, but the object of our faith, because that's the most important thing when it comes to faith. Where is our faith being placed? And, and our faith should be placed in God. That's what this church was known for. Now, we're going to talk about this because this is important. Even though the English translation says your faith, that's technically not correct because no human being can generate faith. Faith is actually a gift from God. What's being referred to here is the, the principle of faith that is operating within this church, and obviously within each individual member, but obviously corporately as a group, they are operating and allowing faith to operate within them. The reason why faith is a gift is that's what the Bible teaches. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. 
And that faith is not of ourselves. It's not something that we can generate. It's not something we can produce. Paul goes on to say, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, faith is actually a gift from God to us when we positively respond to his revelation. Faith always is about responding positively to God's revelation. And when you and I do that, then God, in a sense, births faith in us. He gives us that gift of faith. That's why the Bible differentiates belief from faith. It's why the Bible says demons believe. They know that there's a God. And the Bible says they even tremble at that fact. But they have no faith in God. They do not entrust themselves to God. They, they do not rely on God. They do not depend on God. They seek to live independently from God. Therefore, they have belief, but they have no faith. See, because they do not respond positively to God's revelation. Paul is saying about this church that when the message of God came to them, as he talked about earlier on in chapter 1, they received the message with joy through the Holy Spirit, despite all the affliction and pressures they were going through. We've talked about that already. And because of that, Paul says, God gave them faith. Are we... As a church, being a model of a group of people that are living independently of God or depending on God? Do others see us relying on God or doing things ourselves? Are we entrusting ourselves and our future and, and everything about our church to God? Or are we trying to figure this out for us? See, a church of influence from God's perspective is one where people can say, you know what's different about them? Is they're actually trusting in God to do it. They're, they're relying on God. They're depending on God. They're not trying to do it themselves. And notice he says that kind of faith, that gets spread about. That's something that other churches and other believers and stuff talk about. It's like, man, did you, you hear what they're doing? They're actually trusting in God rather than trying to, you know, figure it out for themselves. That's why Paul goes on to say, we don't need to say anything. We don't need to testify about how great of a church you are. Other people will talk about it if we're placing our faith in God. Because God wants to use churches like Thessalonica and hopefully like our church to again be an example, to inspire other churches and other believers to do the same thing. And that's why he will magnify churches like that, like he did in Thessalonica. How can you and I, how can you and I as believers demonstrate our faith? How can other people see our faith in God? That's a question we not only should ask ourselves every once in a while, it's a question that we need to ask as a church. Are the things that we're doing as a church demonstrating our faith in God? You see? Because that is so important. It's one of the, the ways that, again, a church becomes an example to others. It's one of the ways that, from God's perspective, that church becomes influential. God will not elevate and exalt churches from his perspective where people look and go, well, look at what they did. No. But God will magnify and elevate churches where people look and say, wow, did you see what God did? That's faith, you see. And that's what was happening here. Notice he says, your faith in God has spread. It has literally been dispersed. It's been circulated. Again, so that we don't need to say anything. So, so many churches today concentrate, we need, to get, we need to get who we are out. We need to let other people know. Listen, God says to his people, 
If you just place your faith in me and you live by faith and you trust me and you rely on me and you depend upon me, I'll make sure that your name gets out there. I'll make sure that other people know about you. You don't need to do it yourself. You just focus as a church on what you should be focused on. You trust me. You place your confidence in me. You entrust yourselves and your future and all this to me. And I honestly believe, folks, that that's one of the primary things that God wants to continue to teach us and, and how he wants to grow us and, and the things that we can learn by taking now our church from this phase of meeting in Basha to the phase of maybe, you know, building our own building and all that. It's not about the buildings. It's not about changing location. It's about, as a church, through every step of this process, demonstrating to other believers, we're going to just trust God. We're going to rely on God. We're going to, because this is so much bigger than us that even if we got the smartest people in the room together in this church, we couldn't figure it out. And God's already shown us that. Can I tell you that? Because how this even came about, how we even got a hold of that land for the price that we did and the location that we did, all, God is simply saying, you, you realize if you just sat back and you did what you could do, but you trusted me ultimately, look at what I did for you. And God wants us all to get to that place where, again, we're not trying to do it ourselves. We're re not relying on us. We're not relying on other human beings, but we're looking to God and saying, God, you got to do it. That's a church of faith. That's a life of faith. Then verse 9. For people everywhere report how you welcomed us and how you turned to God from idols. Now, I don't want to get too Greeky on you, but I think this is important here. The word turned in the Greek language is in the aorist tense, which simply means it's a once for all turning. So what Paul is simply saying is, we recognize that you, as a group of believers there in Thessalonica, in this church that we planted, you once and for all turned to God. This word speaks about being converted, speaks about being changed, speaks about being transformed. And notice here, very importantly too, the word order. He doesn't say, we heard that you turned from idols to God. Notice he doesn't say it that way. He says, you turned to God from idols. What this illustrates is so many people today want to try to sort of, in a sense, clean up their own life or make themselves somehow presentable to God by getting everything in their life right, and then they come to God. And God says, first of all, that doesn't work. You can't reform yourself. You've got to turn to me. And when you truly turn to me, all the false gods and all the things in your life and all of that that shouldn't be there, we'll start working on that. And then that becomes that once and for all turning to God then opens up a lifetime process, if you will, of turning to God, of, of having God change us and transform us. But you and I don't have the power in and of ourselves to turn from our idols, to turn from the valueless and, and worthless things that we're a part of, and even the things that have power over us, and somehow we reform ourselves and get ourselves all cleaned up and then turn to God. That never works. God wants us simply to come with all of our stuff, all of our baggage, everything we struggle with, and say, you just turn to me, and I'll deal with the rest. That's why for years and years and years, during the Billy Graham Crusades, what would Billy Graham always end with? The song, Just As I Am. Because that's how God wants us to come. Because you and I can't fix ourselves. Only God can. And we've got to come to a place like the Thessalonians did, where they just once and for all just said, God. My life is a mess. I'm just going to turn to you 
And then you and I can begin to figure this out. And again, when you and I do that, then that begins a lifetime process where then God continually changes and transforms us and conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. It's why Paul would say to the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? A new creation. Old things are going to start passing away. All things are going to start becoming new. Or why Paul goes on to say, and though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being what? Renewed every day, being changed, being transformed. When you and I finally, once and for all, turn to God, then God begins that process of changing and transforming us. And when you are part of a church where all of us are allowing God to transform us, to change us, where we're not resistant to change, where we're saying, God, you mold me. You, you make me after your will. You, you, let, you do what you want to do, God. You bring about the changes that need to happen. You add the things to my life that need to be there. You take out of my life the things that shouldn't be there. But God, you change me. When Christians are willing to put themselves into that process, and let God do his work, then Paul says, that's a church of influence. Because people can see through all the fluff and stuff of churches, all the stuff that's sort of manufactured and, and, and you know, manipulated. But what people can't explain is the supernatural power of God at work to change people's lives. That's what people can't explain. Because that's a power beyond themselves even to grasp and understand apart from, again, receiving the word of God. That's why a, an angry man who becomes less and less angry by turning their life over to God is something that people can't explain. But my goodness, then that person and that church and a a church filled with people like that become an influence. Or why a, a maybe a gal who struggles with anxiety, who now just says, God, change me. I don't want to stay anxious all the time and, and stressed out and, and worried. God, help me to trust you more. When they begin to see that attitude change and whatever, that's a church of influence. When you and I let God transform us, and that's what was happening in the church at Thessalonica. Then he says, you also were turning to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So it's a church of service. But oh my, this word for serve is so different from how you and I many times, even today in our Christian circles and in our churches, think about and use the word service. Because many of us as Christians, when we think about serving God, we're saying, God, I'm doing something for you, but I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And therefore, I'm serving you, God. But this word serve means this. It means to willingly give over the prerogative to be self-governing. It speaks about yielding up. Because, see, God isn't as much interested in the individual acts of service we talk about as, in a sense, the heart attitude behind it all. If I give up my prerogative to be self-governing, then I basically make myself available to God every moment of every day to say, God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to be involved with, at whatever time you want me to do it with God, I make myself available to you. It's, it's the whole premise behind Paul talking about us as Christians finally getting to a place where we present our body a living sacrifice and simply lay our lives on the altar. That's what service is. Because then that, that kind of a mindset, if you will, then God can tap us anytime he wants for anything he wants. That's service. See, again, we think serving is I'm doing what I like to do. I'm doing it in the time frame that's convenient for me. 
I'm showing up, everything's taken care of, but I'm serving God. And I'm not totally discounting that, but I think this is, captures the essence of what it means to have a servant's heart. It's not just about somebody who volunteers every once in a while in the local church to serve. It's about all of us having that attitude of, we're not going to call the shots any longer. We're going to lay ourselves at the altar and let God call the shots. In fact, as I was thinking and meditating on this whole principle, I thought God had me write down some sort of thoughts that, that I would like to share with you for the very first time this morning about a vision for our church in the coming days and weeks and months and maybe years ahead as God prepares for us. As the children of God, we are submitting ourselves without reservation to your leadership. Our resistance to your guidance is crumbling. Our attempts to control our own destinies are being cast off. Our criticisms against your will are growing silent. As with our individual lives, so with our corporate lives, we are being governed by your word. And your word needs no assistance from human reason or pragmatism. God, lead us now. That's, I think, a good vision for any group of believers. So many of us resist God. We, we hold back. I sense that even here at the Oasis, that though many of you are growing and, and, and you're making progress in your spiritual life, every Sunday and every Wednesday, I just, I just sense that in some of you there's that resistance to just totally let go. But folks, if we're going to serve the living and true God, that's where we've got to get to, where we just say, God... It's not about me governing my own life anymore. It's about you. It's about what you want, not what I want. And again, when you and I come with that kind of a heart attitude every day, every moment of the day to the Lord, that's service. Because like I said, then we're not locking ourselves into, well, I serve the Lord because I'm involved in this, this, and this. Again, and not that that's not important, but for God, it's not so much about all those little individual acts or ministries we're involved in as much as the hard attitude we bring to it all. Because then, like I said, then God, if we truly have a servant's heart, then God can even ask us sometimes to step out of the boat and get out of our comfort zone and do things that we wouldn't normally do and do them at a time that might be inconvenient for us, but, Lord, if you're asking me to do it, I'll do it. And maybe even dealing with the person that, really, God, I, I wouldn't choose to be with this person, but, God, if you're saying that you want me to partner with them for a while, then, God, I'll do it, because it's not about me anymore. It's about you. That service. And then verse 10. Paul says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. Now, this message is not on the timing of the rapture. That's going to come in a couple weeks or, or in the tribulation. But I, I do want to mention this here because I think it obviously fits and, and it's important. Because I get asked this question a lot. Pastor Jeff, why do you believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church? Why don't you believe what many others believe, that maybe Jesus is going to come in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation? Why do you not think that the church is going to go through the tribulation? Well, one of the verses I would take you to or take them to would be this very verse. First of all, in my understanding of the Word of God, the tribulation has nothing to do with the church. 
It is the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks that God says, now my focus is off the church because the church isn't even here any longer. My, my focus is now back on Israel for that seven-year period that's still hanging out there that's never been fulfilled. See, too many Christians think that the tribulation still somehow involves the Gentiles. And though there will be obviously Gentiles affected during the tribulation one way or the other, it primarily doesn't even concern the church. It's about the Jew, which, by the way, can I say this? When I look for markers in our modern day and age that, that point to signs that Jesus is coming soon, I don't look at the economy and how bad the stock market's doing, and I don't look at, you know, even the rise of terrorism and all that. I look at the Jew and what's happening to the Jew. And I don't know whether you saw this last week or not, but just last week it was announced that this past 12-month period, there has been an historic record number of Jewish people leaving Europe and coming back home to Israel. Now, folks, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, that's not anything to ignore. Because the Bible teaches that part of what sets up the whole last days and return of God's focus to Israel and the Middle East and everything is when the Jews from all over the world, but especially in Europe, come back to their homeland of Israel. Lisa can tell you, I, I sat up. I was like, whoa, that's huge. And then you have this teaching here and other places where the Bible teaches that the seven-year tribulation is a time of God's wrath. Not just part of it, but the whole seven years. Read the book of Revelation. You think there's going to be a time during that seven years that you wouldn't consider it to be God's judgment? I don't think so. And yet God clearly teaches in his word that Jesus, our deliverer, rescues us from the coming wrath. We're not a part of it. In fact, if you understand even the word deliver, it not only means to rescue, picture this, it means to be drawn to oneself. In other words, when God delivers us, his people, when he rescues us, he literally takes us up in his arms and draws us close to him. And when that happens in your life and my life, that means that throughout the rest of our Christian walk, nothing happens to us that also doesn't happen to him. We are in Christ, and therefore nothing can get to us that doesn't first of all pass through him. Well, now follow the logic here. If I'm wrapped up in Jesus Christ, does there anywhere in the Bible where it says that Jesus Christ in the future is somehow going to experience again the wrath of God? No. The Bible teaches that he experienced the wrath of God once when he became sin for us who knew no sin, when he took our penalty for sin on the cross, that's when he experienced the wrath of God. But there is nothing in the Bible that teaches somewhere down the road Jesus is going to have to experience the wrath of God again. And if you understand what it means to be delivered, that means that Jesus Christ is holding all of us. And it means that then whatever you and I go through, he goes through with us. And Jesus Christ, I guarantee you, isn't ever going to experience the wrath of God again. Which means you and I who are in Christ aren't ever going to experience the wrath of God either. By accepting Jesus Christ as our sin bearer, we have been delivered from the wrath of God. One other thing. The Bible clearly teaches, and we're going to study this in just a moment, that the return of Jesus Christ, the rapture, is an imminent thing, meaning it could happen at any time. Well, if you take the position that Jesus Christ is going to come in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, that takes all the imminency out of it. 
because you know, based upon prophetic scriptures, the exact marker of the middle of the tribulation. It is the abomination of desolation in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem. So there's nothing imminent then about the return of Christ in the mid-trib view. There's also nothing then imminent about the post-trib view, that Jesus Christ comes at the end of the tribulation. You'll know exactly when he's coming. And by the way, he is coming at the end of the tribulation, but it's not called the rapture. It's called the second coming of Jesus Christ. Two different events separated by seven years in the Bible. So the fifth marker or characteristic of a church of influence is that we are a group of people who are waiting for the sun to come from heaven. What does it mean to wait on Jesus to come back? Well, it doesn't mean to go out to some mountain around here, sit in the lotus position and hum. <laughs> okay, Jesus, I'm just waiting for you to come. No. Again, waiting is a very active term. It means to be very active in what I need to be active in doing because I am living every moment in anticipation and expectation of his coming with a rising intensity. That's what the word wait means. Are we waiting on the Lord? See, to wait on the Lord means that I plan as if I have a lifetime to serve him, but I prepare my heart that I could meet him any second. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. And folks, I have lived a lifetime hearing about when Jesus is going to come. We don't know. Jesus even said, the angels in heaven don't even know the time of my return. And yet throughout my lifetime, whether it was preachers or ministers or so-called evangelists or whoever you want to say, or even other Christians, you know, I remember all the way back in 1972, and I'm sure it was before that, but that's as early as I can remember. I was only 11 then anyway. But, and I, Jesus is coming in 1972. He didn't, did he? No. Then, oh, he's coming in 76. Then I heard about 80. Then there was that famous 88 reasons why he's going to come in 1988. And then, of course, there was 2000. Oh, he's got to come in the year 2000, right? That just all makes sense. And, no. Because again, God doesn't want us waiting, trying to figure out when he comes. God just wants us to be ready any moment for his return. That's what it means to wait. I'll share this with you today that I remind myself of. No one knows the time. So don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time. He could come at any time. That's what it means to wait. <laughs> Are you ready to meet Jesus? If Jesus were to come in the next few moments, are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's going to be two groups of Christians when Jesus comes back. Those who can stand before him in confidence and those who shrink away in shame because of where their spiritual life is when he returns. See, this church was filled with people who were waiting for Jesus, meaning that almost every day and even throughout the day, they were living as if I could be standing before my Lord any time. And I want to make sure that when Jesus comes back, he finds me doing what I need to be doing. That's what it means to wait. Planning my life as if I have a lifetime to serve him, but preparing my heart that at any moment I could see Jesus. So Paul ends chapter 1 by saying the reason why this church is such an example and a church of influence is because this was a church 
that echoed forth the Word of God. This was a church that demonstrated faith in God. This was a church that was turning to God and letting God transform their lives. This was a church that truly understood what it meant to serve the living and true God. And this was a church that was waiting on the sun from heaven to come back. May we be like this church. And may we as individuals be ready to meet Jesus. Let's pray. God, today, we know that based upon Scripture, the Lord Jesus could come at any time for his church. I hope and pray, God, that everyone here in this auditorium today is prepared for that time. I hope everyone here has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That they know that if you were to come in the clouds for your church, to gather your church from this earth and take us back to heaven, that they would be part of that number. And God, if there's anyone here who has doubts, who's struggling with the assurance even of that, would you Help them to find a brother or sister in Christ or a pastor from this church or someone, God, that they can sit down and process that, that with and nail that down in their life. Because, God, you want us to live with the confidence that if Jesus were to come, we know where we're going. And you want us to have that same confidence as we face death. That there's no question where we're going after we die. We know we're going to be with Jesus. But God, there's another question. And that is that even as a Christian who knows where we're going when we die or when the rapture takes place, it doesn't mean that all of us as Christians are where we should be spiritually speaking. Maybe there are some here today that they need to get some things in order in their life and allow you, God, to sort of bring about those changes and those transformations before Jesus comes. And God, thank you in your mercy that you give us time to make those changes. And even by the fact, God, that you inspired this message upon my heart to deliver to these people and to others who will hear this message, go out. God, that's a way for you to reach into our hearts and into our minds and get us to a different place in our life before Jesus comes. I do believe that Jesus is coming soon. I don't know the day. I don't know the year. But I believe Jesus is coming soon, and I want to be ready when he comes. And I want to be part of a local church that is filled with people that are ready when he comes. We are waiting, Jesus, on you. God, may we sing this ending song as a song of, of commitment, of dedication, of affirmation of our faith in you, God, as we give you our all and we give you our lives and we lay our lives down on that altar once for all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.